This lecture is based on the book of Scott Breer, Principles of Trauma Therapy. Let's look at common treatments for post-traumatic stress disorder. These include cognitive behavior therapy, or CBT, exposure therapy, and eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, so-called EMDR. Pharmacological interventions typically include antidepressants such as serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or SSRIs. In recent years, technology such as computer-aided exposure therapy has significantly improved the experience and effectiveness of exposure therapy. EMDR therapy helps the patient analyze and formulate responses to traumatic events by exploring both physiological and neurological changes in relation to traumatic memories. Multi-component therapies are also being explored. For example, improvements in PTSD and substance abuse symptoms have been shown through the combined use of CBT along with structured writing therapy, as well as integrated exposure therapy. Other combined therapies with CBT include emotion regulation training and music and dance therapy. Virtual reality exposure therapy, or VRET, is one of the most promising areas of PTSD therapy. Living with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder causes impairments in daily life through the persistent re-experiencing of the negative event via recollections, such as intrusive negative thoughts and dreams, flashbacks, and dissociative states in some cases. Under DSM-5, emotional reactions to the traumatic events such as fear and helplessness are no longer part of the criteria for PTSD. The effect of PTSD on daily life and overall prognosis are related to the severity of the exposure. PTSD is associated with high-risk professions such as the military, policing, firefighting, and emergency medical work. PTSD has significantly limited daily functioning in those exposed to extreme and prolonged trauma, such as war veterans. Depression is a common experience of war veterans with PTSD. The comorbidity of PTSD and depression produces lower quality of life scores in physical and mental well-being than those for a single disorder. Let's look at primary treatment goals. The primary treatment goal of acute stress disorder is to prevent the disorder from developing into PTSD, which is chronic and involves long-term social and occupational impairment. Debriefing or crisis therapy is one method of quickly treating acute stress disorder. The goals of crisis therapy are to promote a sense of safety after a trauma, calm the victim, promote a sense of self-efficacy, encourage community or victim connectedness, and instill a sense of hope. Debriefing can be done in various ways. When an entire community is affected by a catastrophe, such as a school shooting or natural disaster, group therapy is helpful. During individual therapy, victims of trauma can share their personal narrative related to the traumatic event and quickly develop coping skills. When crisis therapy is unavailable or does not effectively eliminate acute stress disorder, acceptance and commitment therapy is a method of psychotherapy that promotes the use of mindfulness to accept a traumatic event. Mindfulness describes the act of living in the present moment. Most symptoms of acute stress disorder keep the victim's thoughts and feelings in the moment of the trauma rather than present circumstances or future possibilities. Mindfulness also promotes a sense of acceptance. Patients are coached to recognize and accept the pain associated with their traumatic experience. Once symptoms of acute stress disorder are managed, patients must learn to use stress management and reduction techniques to prevent PTSD from developing at a later time. 
Common components of stress management and reduction include thought stopping, relaxation, breathing, assertive training, behavior rehearsal, and psychoeducation. In a sense, individuals who present with intrusive trauma-related symptoms are attempting to metabolize or internally resolve distressing thoughts, feelings, and memories. This reframes PTSD symptoms as adaptive and recovery-focused rather than pathological. Therapeutic exposure and other exposure to processing traumatic memories may work by optimizing those activities in which the client is already engaged. Clients are not a collection of symptoms, but rather people who are attempting to recover, meaning that emotional pain is necessarily intrinsically negative. Trauma can result in growth. Adversity and stress beyond their capacity to disrupt or injure often help others to develop in positive ways. Positives are new levels of psychological resilience, additional survivor skills, greater self-knowledge and self-acceptance, a great sense of being alive, increased empathy, and a more broad and complex view of life. For example, a recently uh, widowed person may learn new independence. The survivor of a heart attack might develop a more healthy perspective on life's priorities. We see that all the time. The person exposed to a catastrophic event may learn important things about themselves in the face of tragedy. Growth might be difficult in some traumatic events. Some events are so overwhelming that they make growth extremely difficult. They may involve so much loss that it seems impossible and disrespectful to suggest any eventual positive outcome. Survivors of child abuse, torture, and disfigurement, for example, may feel that they are permanently injured or ruined for life. Treatment should not be limited to symptom reduction. It may also include the possibility of new awareness and developing insights and skills. The following are important. One, acknowledge their bravery. The easy choice for a client is to block trauma pain. By engaging in memories and psychological distress and the attempt to integrate them into the fabric of their life is brave. Continuous appreciation of their bravery is a central task for the clinician. Also, the therapist should accomplish a respectful and positive attitude. A Rogerian unconditional positive regard, showing a non-judgmental positive appraisal, assists in establishing that therapeutic rapport. Remember, it is compassion, not pity, that is important. Two. Hope is critically important to treatment. The client may expect continuing despair as part of their future. The task of the therapist should be to reframe trauma as a challenge, pain as awareness and growth, and the future as opportunity. Acknowledge the client's perspective, but don't reinforce the helpless, hopelessness, and demoralization of the client. Acknowledge the incredible hurt the client has experienced, and at the same time, gently suggest his or her presence in treatment signals implicit strength, adaptive capacity, and hopefulness in the future. Hope is a powerful antidote to the helplessness and despair with major traumas and losses. 3. The Pain Paradox Traumatized people sometimes engage in pain-enhancing or sustained behaviors while trying to reduce painful or upsetting states, but they only end up increasing PTSD distress and often make things more chaotic. Friends and society say to them, just get over it or put the past behind you or take pulls. The message is that pain is bad, medicate it, or distract or remove the pain. Modern psychology and religion such as Buddhism suggests that avoiding unwanted thoughts, feelings, and memories actually increases or sustains pain. Symptoms and distress. Those who drink, use drugs, dissociate, avoid discussing what happened and or engage in other avoidance behaviors 
such as denial or thought suppression, are more likely to develop intrusive and chronic PTSD problems and syndromes. The pain paradox suggests that people who have been hurt do best if they can present in their pain, avoid it less, and experience more. Pain is therefore not bad. Experiences of pain, distress, or flashbacks are actually good. It represents access to experiences that can be cognitively and emotionally processed and, once addressed, may lessen or fall away. Paradox is related to how we are socialized to address emotional pain and discomfort. The implications of the pain paradox for trauma therapy are significant. They suggest that one's ongoing experience allow access to non-overwhelming amounts of painful memory and encourage deeper insight into the basis for ongoing suffering, whereas medications that only numb unwanted emotional states. Let's now look at some central treatment principles. First of all, provide and ensure safety. This means you provide psychological safety. Do not criticize, humiliate, reject, dramatically misunderstand, needlessly interrupt or laugh during the treatment process. Do not violate psychological boundaries and therapist-client confidentiality. Then, the client can reduce defenses and openly process the thoughts, feelings, and memories associated with a traumatic event. Let's look at safety. The client must perceive safety when they come to treatment. Due to hypervigilance, many traumatized people come to expect danger. And therefore, coming to treatment, they might present as even more hypervigilant. Treatment can take longer with PTSD clients, and therefore, the therapist must be patient. Stability. Stability is an ongoing psychological and physical state whereby one is not overwhelmed by disruptive internal or external stimuli. It is important to consider for trauma survivors, since adverse events can be destabilizing and lead to further susceptibility to stress. Some trauma-related responses, drugs, personality disorder traits, can contribute to unstable lifestyles, such as homelessness, recurrent involvement in chaotic and intense relationships, or chronic self-destructiveness. Let's look at types of stability. In life, we look at stable living conditions. The first intervention might be to do social casework and help arrange adequate food, shelter, and physical safety. The absence of that might lead to early exit out of therapy or not being regular in coming to therapy. We look at emotional. The client should have some level of psychological homeostasis before certain aspects of trauma therapy are initiated. If there are high levels of psychosis, high suicidality, high levels of PTSD symptoms, debilitating anxiety or depression, it is not a good idea to start with the PTSD therapy itself, but first address the symptoms. Maintain a positive and consistent therapeutic relationship. One of the components of successful trauma-related therapy appears to be a good working relationship between the client and the therapist. Distant, uninvolved, or emotionally disconnected relationships between the client and the therapist often have less positive outcomes. When we have a positive relationship between the therapist and the client, we have less dropout rate, we have less avoidance, and higher attendance. We have greater medication compliance, there is more openness and acceptance to support and therapist suggestions, and more capacity to tolerate painful thoughts and feelings in therapy when they are exposed to trauma memories. Let's look at the therapeutic structure. Because abuse survivors may lack integrated self-awareness of their own issues and needs, a poor idea of boundaries, and often present with entitlements, 
It is important to address structural parameters of the therapy relationship directly. This includes the need to assess for safety, that you have to assess for suicidal thoughts, self-regard, self-determination. They are going to be active in the therapy and eventually have to take responsibility. And you also directly discuss the rules of your therapy, the limits of therapy, as well as boundaries such as when you are available, when you can be called, who do they call in a crisis, etc. The therapeutic structure that you create allows for vulnerability and intimacy while structuring for safety and self-determination. It works to reassure the client that by nature of the limits established up front, therapy will not re-violate or create an abuse dynamic. It defines the outer limits of treatment so the client knows what to expect and what not to expect. And it offers a sense of containment. It's reliable, predictable environment from which to confront upsetting memories or feelings. Therapy as reality based. Because child abuse teaches people that human relationships are dangerous or full with conflict, it alters perceptions of and response to power, intimacy, and relationships. Clients may project or transfer abuse-based understanding and cognitive defenses onto the therapist and the clinical relationship. The therapist might be seen as abuser-like or as an all-powerful rescuer, or it can be seen as a fantasy friend or lover. The clinician may become representative of what the client fears or desires as any real person and may create behaviors in the therapy relationship that are symbolic and or fantasy driven. So it's influenced by projection and fantasy. This requires the therapist to be gentle but steadfast insistent on reality-based interactions. The focus of therapy should be on understanding, clarification and awareness so increasing the client's ability to view themselves and others without blinders. The clinician must work to keep their therapeutic relationship reality oriented, rather than a re-experiencing of the distortions and dissociations present in the original abuse or of fantasies that helped the client to cope in the past. In setting the therapy up as reality-based, the following is useful. The use of Socratic therapy. We have the frequent, gentle use of questions to facilitate self-discovery and understanding. Questions such as, what do you think all of this means? Why do you think you needed to cut on yourself when you remember that? What are you feeling right now? What just happened there? Also, the use of interpretation. Carefully timed suggestions regarding what clinicians believe to be the basis for the client's behavior. Making connections between current problems and childhood experiences. And, but, be careful about reinforcing fantasy by the overuse of interpretation. Breer gives an example of how one can address a client to keep the therapy reality base. I understand your desire to have a special relationship with me, one that meets your needs for connectedness, protection, even love. But our relationship isn't for those things. It's better because it's based on you and your continued growth, not on a fantasy that could be blown away in a minute. Because it's real, you can count on it. The good news is that although I am not your fantasized savior, parent, lover, this relationship is a place where you can feel supported and examine things you otherwise might not. It is important to remember that trauma therapy is more likely to be most effective when tailored to the specific characteristics and concerns of the individual person. Therefore, guard against using a prescribed method and pushing your client into that therapeutic mode 
rather make sure that you tailor the treatment to the needs and specific characteristics and concerns of the person that you're treating for trauma. Let's look at, a, at an important aspect, affect regulation. This refers to a person's capacity to tolerate and internally reduce painful emotional states. Some clients with trauma has limited affect regulation. People with limited affect regulation are emotional and they are more likely to be overwhelmed and destabilized by negative emotional experiences, such as when you want to discuss the trauma event with them. It is better to work on memories and trauma processing over time at limited levels, which ultimately lead to significant symptom relief and greater emotional capacity without the negative side effect of overwhelming effect. So therefore you need to know when limited affect regulation or present in the client, you have to go slow and you have to take time. Negative issues. The trauma survivor might easily have triggered perceptions of themselves as inadequate, bad or helpless, and expectations of others as dangerous, rejecting or unloving, and a view of the future as hopeless, a very concrete view. Such distortions affect the perception of the therapist and the therapy. They will carry that viewpoint into the therapeutic context. They might experience sudden feelings of abandonment, rejection, or betrayal during therapy. So it's therefore important that the therapist do not reinforce the client's negative expectations and avoid triggering underlying cognitive emotional gestalts. So be warm, caring, and point out that they have abandonment issues and adjust or tailor therapy to try not to trigger these issues. Gender. Men and women undergo some of the same traumatic events and suffer in some of the same ways, but also some traumas occur more in one gender. Sex role socialization affects how such injuries are experienced and expressed. The therapist needs to be alert to how the trauma is processed based on the person's social expectations. For example, a woman who was sexually assaulted may feel they somehow enticed their perpetrator into raping them. And often that's how the world also views that. So it's important to keep in mind the gender of the person and also sex role socialization and being understanding and approach it with empathy. Social maltreatment as a trauma issue. People with lesser social status are more likely to be victimized and in lower socioeconomic status people, we find a higher incidence of child abuse, neglect, exposure to domestic violence, assaults by peers, community violence, shootings, robbery, sexual exploitation, refuge due status, and murder of a family member or friend. Let's look at an important aspect, managing clinician counteractivations. There may be occasions when the therapist responds to cognitive emotional processes, the expectations, beliefs, emotions, that are strongly influenced by their own prior personal experiences, especially those that involve childhood maltreatment and adult trauma. Therefore, the therapist must monitor both positive and negative countertransference. Therapist denial or cognitive avoidance of certain subjects or themes during treatment must be monitored. Avoiding discussion of the client's trauma with decreased emotional attunement is a clear sign of clinical counteractivation. Therapists in cases like this may neutralize uh, or slow therapy as a means of avoiding their own triggers. Counteractivation then occurs when the therapist responds to clients with cognitive emotional processes that are strongly influenced by their own prior personal experiences. It also occurs when the, th 
the therapist experienced denial or cognitive avoidance of certain subjects or themes during the treatment process. A clinician who tends to avoid thinking about unresolved traumatic material in his or her life may unconsciously work to prevent the client from exploring his or her own trauma-related memories or feelings. The best way to prevent problems in treatment, consult with a seasoned therapist or supervisor who is familiar with trauma issues or form a group consultation. And you may also consider to attend your own psychotherapy if you discover unresolved traumatic issues in your life. Practice ethically and within the standard of care. It is very important for the therapist to maintain boundaries. Refrain from any form of exploitation or maltreatment. Guarding the client's confidentiality. Support identity development and functioning and or encourage a positive therapeutic relationship. The therapist should not overdisclose his or her personal history. It's not about you. Relationships, preferences, or ideas about things unrelated to the client. This addresses professional and ethical issues around dual relationships, clinical boundaries, and professional standards of care. Good documentation and charting helps to monitor the client's progress in therapy. So therefore, in summary, Ethical care of your trauma client includes the following. Honoring client boundaries, refraining from any form of exploitation, reporting or intervening when there is potential danger to the client, guard confidentiality, support identity development and functioning, limit self-disclosure of your own trauma, establish caring, empathetic relationship, Avoid authoritarian or overly directive treatment. Be aware of your own strong feelings or over-identification with the client during therapy.